Good morning, everyone. Thursday morning. We here in Rock Hill, South Carolina have weathered the storm. We had a big thunderstorm last night with lightning and huge clouds and thunder and a little bit. We even lost power for just a second. Then it came right back on. We're very grateful for that. But uh, we've got a nice green lawn. <laughs> All the lawns were getting brown and crunchy. And so John is so happy that we got some rain, and I am too. Um, and as we learned in our church, uh, rain is always a sign of blessing. So we thank the Lord for the blessing of rain. And of course, if you get too much rain, it doesn't turn so much into a blessing. But we're thankful for the nice, the, the nice uh, quiet rain that we got last night to water our, our lawns and, and just help, it, um, help the water tables and all the things that rain does. And um, I'm hoping that you're joining us from wherever you are. We usually have out-of-state uh, people coming in and joining us, and, uh, and we welcome you, uh, family and friends and people from our church that I attend here in Rock Hill, and neighbors, um, it's been just really wonderful. Um, so I want to just, since I've got a few, I, I usually go a couple of minutes before I get to the, the meet, um, but I wanted to it, it kind of go over um, two weeks ago, and that was, we're, we're in that part of the Lord's Prayer that says, forgive um, your debts as you forgive those who uh, have debt against you. And we talked about perspective and that uh, forgiveness is not a feeling. Um, that would be great if it was. That would be like, oh, I forgave and I can feel great, but that's not the criteria for true biblical forgiveness. Um, and so we talked about that. And I told you my crazy story about my little journey into forgiveness from a real deep hurt. That, um, that w And they came from words. The hurt came from words. Um, and they can come from words. And we're going to talk about that too. But I want to try to finish. It's, it's a big subject. And it's chock full of real living. And that's really where we are. Like, what does it mean to forgive? And, and how do I do it? And that's what we want to talk about today. Um, how, how do we do it? Um, and so I want to just jump right in if that's okay. And if you, if you come in late, just go back to the beginning, okay? Um, this is always uh, taped or whatever they call it now. And you can go back and, and find it either on my page, um, Vicki Ritchie uh, on Facebook or uh, at Christ Fellowship's page. Um, so there's steps to forgiveness and healing. Um, the first one is the act of forgiveness. It's an act of our will. <clears throat> it's got nothing to do with feelings. When, when, when someone has hurt us or sinned against us or wounded us in some way, something has happened, we exert our will and we decide to forgive. This is what the Bible says. This is the God model of forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, if he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So God wills to do that. And he made a way for us to receive forgiveness. The same thing happens with us. We set our will, an act of our will to forgive. We can be weeping and crying from the hurt, but, but still exert our will to do it. This is our model. You heard God's model, and then this is what the Bible teaches about ours. Colossians 3.13. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance or a hurt or a wound, as it can be translated, against someone, forgive as the Lord forgives you. So how does the Lord forgive us? Well, the first thing he does is he forgives instantaneously. When you became a Christian, when I became a Christian, I went to the Lord, I, I, I ran, uh, and I felt the weight of my transgression against him so great, but he instantly forgave. And so many times what we want to do, we want to forgive, but we want to hold them over sort of like a spit, you know, over a fire and roast them, <laughs> turn them around and make sure they understand what this meant to me and how bad this hurt. Um, that's not the God model. The God model is instantaneous forgiveness in an act of our will. That's only the first step, though. So once we do that, that's the, actually it's the most important part. If we can keep reminding ourselves as we go into the second step, I, I exerted my will. I have chosen to forgive, 
period. Uh, this, um, the second part is the process of forgiveness. The first one is the act of forgiveness, which is, involves our will. The second one is the process of forgiveness. And of course, that, the length of time and the difficulty of that is how deep the offense was. If somebody took your parking places, the, the offenses and the process is going to be pretty quick. Oh, that makes me so mad. And by the time we get into the store, we're over it. We can be aggravated, but, but the offense is not that deep. So the process is not that long. However, when there is um, sin against us or betrayal, that's a deep wound. Uh, lies, that's a deep wound. Abandonment, abuse, infidelity, violence, all of those things are are very deep wounds. And so the process isn't easy and it's not short. Now the act is, once you decide to forgive, the, forgive, the, the forgiveness of the act or the words or the hurt or the wound is instantaneous. That's done in Jesus' name, just like God did. I am forgiving by an act of my will. And you immediately begin to go into the process. So those that are closest to us are, really hold the key to what hurts us the most. Remember we asked two weeks ago, uh, who holds our peace? Do we? Does God? Does someone else? Uh, are our nights sleepless? Does our stomach hurt when we think about that person or whatever? They are holding the key to our peace. And so... The, the question to ask here in the process is, what is the cost of forgiveness, Vicki? I've, I've done the will. I've, I've exercised my will to forgive. Now I'm in the process and I'm hurting so bad. So what is the cost when we forgive? Here's the example. Um, I come up to you and say, I'm in a really tight spot. I wonder if you could loan me $100. And you being the wonderful, godly Christian woman that you are, say, why, of course I can. And you give me $100. And I come back a little later and say, everything didn't turn out the way I thought. And I don't have the $100 to pay you back. I don't know what to do. And you say, out of the love and kindness of your heart, it's okay, Vicki, I forgive you that debt. You don't have to pay me back. Just forget it. So the question is, what did it cost you to forgive the debt? The answer is $100. It cost you the exact amount of what you forgave. And you say, well, that's not so hard. No, that isn't. But what if, what if it was $1,000? What if I had come to you and you said, ooh, that's really steep, but let me talk to my husband or let me see what I, and, and you lent me the 1000 and I came back and said, I can't pay it. <clears throat> and you forgave me the debt. What would it cost? The cost of forgiveness would have been $1,000 or 10,000, or 100,000, whatever it was that you lent and you forgave, that's what it would cost you. The biblical forgiveness is just this, and this is a hard, hard truth. I release you from paying that debt. I will assume the cost of that debt to me, just like the money. You are no longer responsible. That's what biblical forgiveness really is. It's exactly what Jesus did for us. When we came to him for salvation, he said, I have assumed the cost of your sin. You are no longer responsible. Can you just grasp that? We have been released of a death sentence. That's what he did. And so our forgiveness costs what we forgive. Forgiveness always costs the weight of the offense. It always costs the hurt. It always costs the value of what is being forgiven. The deeper the value, the, the harder the process is and the deeper the cost, the greater the cost. Forgiveness costs the exact extent of our loss. That's hard, isn't it? Some of you may be saying, what are you saying? I have to pay the cost for what someone has done to me? That's not what I said. That's what the Bible teaches, is that forgiveness means just what God did for us. And when Christ lives in us, we then 
we then have the authority and the privilege of giving that to someone else. The debt is, when the debt is great, the cost is great. And when you forgive by an act of your will and you begin the process, that's what happens. Exactly what happens. You start to bear the weight of what you have been forgiven. But it's worth getting out of prison. It really is. It was worth getting out of prison for me when I carried that hurt for so long. And finally, that process, that long process came and then we come to the end. And I'm going to get to that in just a minute. Often the other person that has hurt us, if we're talking about us needing um, to forgive someone, they go on. They're fine. But we're the ones who suffer. We're the ones who are sick. We're the ones who have headaches. And we're the ones who weep in silence by ourselves. And we're the ones who go over and over in our head, over. And it, we live in this prison of unforgiveness. And this is the answer to bitterness and resentment. In God's prayer, in the Lord's prayer, this is the answer to those negative emotions that the Lord's prayer answers. He doesn't want us to be bitter. He doesn't want us to be resentful about something that happened. He wants us to be free. So here's a question. Can we ask God for what we refuse to give? Can we? I want to tell you a quick story about, I told you how I had to forgive someone. Now I want to tell you about how I was forgiven by someone. And that was my darling Gary. And we had only been married just a short time. And I was carrying something. Um, and I needed to tell him and I needed to confess because it, I knew that, that it would be with me and I needed to tell him, but I was shamed. I was embarrassed and I was afraid. And, um, he knew something was bothering me. And one night we were laying on the top of the bed watching sports, I'm sure. Um, and he said, Vicki, what is, what is wrong? I know something is wrong. And, and I started just weeping and crying. And he said, you've been care. I just tell me. And I, I looked down cause I couldn't look at his beautiful blue eyes and it all came, you know, out and it was no most, <laughs> when I've told that story before, people think that I had sex before marriage with someone else. That was not it, but it was a moral failure and it did in uh, and I knew it would hurt him. Um, and so as it came spilling out, I was weeping and, you know, snotting and crying and, and I couldn't look and it, it tumbled out. And I, I, I was just, I said, I, I'm sorry. I, you know, I have to tell you, and this is what Gary did. The first thing he did is he took his hand and he raised my chin so that I would look at him and my eyes were still averted. He said, look at me, look at me real quietly, and I did. And this is what he said. He said, Vicki, I'm so sorry that you've carried this for so long. I'm so sorry. This will be as if it never happened. This will be as if it never happened. I will never think of it again. I will never speak of it again. We will never speak of it again. And he kissed my tears and held me in those strong arms. What Gary did that night, Gary handed me back my life. He just gave it back to me on a silver platter, no strings attached. And 40, after 40 years, he kept that promise he treated me better than I ever deserved to be treated. Loved me. He adored me. It was so obvious. And Gary, that night, was the closest picture of Jesus in a human being that I had ever seen before or since. And what that tells me is that we carry within us the person of Jesus Christ who forgave, who forgave, even as he was being slain, he forgave. We have that wonderful privilege and opportunity to give, humanly speaking, someone who has come, sinned against us or hurt us or wounded us. And that's what he did. Do you ever wonder why I still love that man? 
after 55 years of marriage. Oh, I always will. That's, that's biblical forgiveness. And that helps the process. Now, Gary, I know, had to process that. He never said anything ever again. But I know that in his heart, he had to go through that and process that, what had happened and what I had told him. It was a precious thing. And I'm privileged to tell you that. So what we have to do is ask correctly. We don't say, I said I was sorry, okay? Uh, that's not asking for forgiveness. What do you want from me? Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, that is not forgiveness. We ask, we say what we have done, what we have said, the attitude that we said it, or what we did, whatever it is, and then we say, will you please forgive me? I'm so sorry. Even if we think, well, that's stupid. Why are they upset about that? It doesn't matter that we're not upset. It matters that we have upset someone else. And so then we say, whatever it is, if I hurt you, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I did not mean to. Or if we meant to, we have to say, I'm sorry I said that. That was wrong and cruel and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. That's one of the biblical steps of forgiveness, not just assuming. Um, have you ever had to forgive someone who wasn't there? I've had to do that. The person I had to forgive was gone. They were dead. Um, but I, I was in the prison and I wanted out of that prison. And so um, the, this the other situation in my life, I had to forgive even though they weren't there to say, can you please forgive me? Sometimes guilt follows that and it'll haunt. You know, and if, if you've asked for forgiveness, you may need that person to reassure you it's, it's done. It's, I promise you, it's done. Or you may need to reassure someone and say, it's okay, it's done. We're, it's under the blood. We're, we're, done. we're finished. I have forgiven you. And that's all that there is to it. This is what Daniel 9.9 9 says. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. So he's merciful and forgiving, even when we have done bad things, rebelled right against him to his face. That's what Daniel says. But he's loving and merciful and he forgives us. Jesus continued to suffer after he forgave. The first thing that he said on the cross is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But he continued to suffer. The agonies of not only the physical agonies, but the agonies of becoming sin for the, for the ones that he loved so much. So the, the physicality of being hurt continues even after we forgive so that's what I'm saying. We can't rely on feelings. Ah, I forgave. Now I, I just feel great. No, not always. Sometimes you do maybe, but a lot of times this process that we're talking about is long and difficult and very, very hard. Eventually we arrive at the state of forgiveness. It's like a deep wound. You take care of it. You keep away from it. The body protects it. You wrap it up. But then eventually as that wound heals, then you can touch it and you can use your arm or your hand or your leg or whatever because the healing has come. And that's the third step. The first step is the act of forgiveness by our will. The second step is the process of forgiveness also by an act of our will. But it can be long and hard, but we choose to do that. And the third one is that we arrive at the state of forgiveness. And that means that the offense no longer has the power to control our feelings, our thoughts, our days, are, are, are weeping and crying and, and the muddled of our mind and the sick stomach that we carried for so long, the sleepless nights, the buckets of tears, the illness that we feel, because it can cause illness. Bitterness, believe me, bitterness and resentment can cause physical ailments to avoiding that person. That, that part is gone. When you arrive at that state of forgiveness, when I told you that story two weeks ago about how deeply I was hurt, I remembered it all. I remembered the weeping and crying, but I was no longer affected by it. I haven't been for, for years and years and years because I had arrived at the state of forgiveness where that wound no longer had control. I, got, I probably have a little scar from that, but I learned from that. And God was so gracious to take me through that long process and heal me. And, um, and then you, then it, it doesn't have control over me. It doesn't make me sick to my stomach. It doesn't make me feel worthless and hor horrible, like I was the most horrible person in the world, like it did in the beginning, because I had arrived at that place of healing where I could remember 
but no more control. So I want to tell you the story of Marietta Yeager. She and her family did went on a camping trip, as they always did every year. And during the night, um, their seven-year-old Susie was cut from her tent. She was abducted, she was assaulted, and tortured for a week, and then strangled. One year to the day that she was missing, this is before they knew that she had been gone for a year, the murderer called Marietta, and he taunted her on that one-year anniversary about the kidnapping. But in that year, Marietta Yeager had gone through the process of forgiveness, according to her. She, just, she, she said, I, I couldn't carry it. It was too awful. Susie was gone. We didn't know what had happened. We assumed that she was gone from us forever, but I couldn't carry what I was carrying. So I made a choice to forgive and begin to work through that whole year of forgiveness. So for over a year, she had gone through the process. He was on the phone with her for an hour and 20 minutes because she spoke kindly to him. It surprised him. She told him about her journey and that she had forgiven him by an act of her will. She asked questions and kept, but, but because of her attitude, because she wasn't railing against him, I guess, or accusing him or whatever, she kept him on the phone for an hour and 20 minutes. And during that time, the authorities were able to gather enough clues about what he said to arrest him. She asked um, permission to speak to him face to face after he was arrested. And when she did, she told him that story that she had forgiven him. She goes, I wanted to see your face and I wanted to tell you that with the help of Jesus, I was able to forgive you for what had happened. And then she, that's when they discovered what had happened to her precious little Susie. That same day after their face-to-face -face meeting, after his arrest, he went to his, um, well, no, let me tell you, during, during this meeting, this face-to-face, -face, he confessed to four other child murders that he had committed and gave them names and information. He went back to his cell and that same day he hanged himself in his cell. People say to her, she said this, people say to me, forgiveness for the man that did that to your daughter? Forgiveness, that's easy. And she said, my answer is, have you tried it? Have you tried it? She went with the murderer's mother to bury her son. And Marietta said she lost a child too. The media was absolutely speechless. They followed her around. They wanted to understand what had happened. How could this be? How could you show kindness to this woman? How could you go to his grave? And she was able to share the incredible power of forgiveness through Jesus Christ, her Lord. And then she began to speak and share about it. And God opened up tremendous opportunities for his glory. And here's what I wanted to end that story with. Her forgiveness cost the exact weight of her loss, which was the horrifying death of her seven-year-old Susie. That's what it cost her to forgive that man. When we're freshly wounded, we, like I said, we protect the wound. We, we, we watch over it. But over time, when that wound heals, we're able to move into a different direction. And sometimes the pain of a wound against us will actually move us to forgiveness. It hurts and we can't live there anymore. So God moves us to a place of freedom to be forgiven. It's not amnesia. We could remember it, but its power is gone. Your prison doors are open. And when that happens, we have to walk out of that prison door, slam the cell door shut, hand Jesus the key, and let him throw the key away, and we must never look for that key again. Because once that's done, it's dead and it's gone, and it no longer controls our life. Do you know how many Christians are controlled and eaten alive, so to speak, by unforgiveness, resentment, bitterness of something that hasn't happened? It doesn't need to be. I had it in my own life given to me by another human being who is fallible, but who chose to forgive. Marietta Yeager cho cho chose to forgive and changed the little world that she lived in, changed this mother's heart. 
and gave this man a chance to receive the forgiveness that he so desperately needed. Unforgiveness is a breeding ground of of bitterness and resentment. It doesn't have to be. We have the authority. We have the opportunity to get rid of it. Forgiveness is spiritual. It's not physical. That's a big mistake people make. Here's an, here's an example. If we start a fire and we're too close to it, we may get burned even though we're forgiven for starting the fire and somebody gets the fire out. But we may carry scars for the rest of our life because we were too close to it. If we have sex, say before marriage and we get pregnant, we can be forgiven instantly, just like that from God. And we will spend eternity with him. But a baby is coming. So the consequences of decisions that we make are there, good or bad. Boundaries may still need to be in in your life to someone that you have forgiven who is toxic, who's hateful, who's abusive, who who's lied and all those other deep wounds. You may need to put up a gate and put a little lock on the inside and say, you know, I'll decide when you can come in and how close you can sit to me. Uh, we have to maybe sideline them in our lives and, and, um, and, and make good decisions based on boundaries. They're not made out of anger and they're not made out of retribution. They're made out of safety and wisdom. And God says we don't have to like everybody. We have to love everybody. Can we bless them? I sure can. I told you how I blessed this person and, and can we, can we want them to, uh, to, 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 to be blessed by God and, and have good health and all, all of those things? Yes, you can do that and not like the person or what they're doing. Here's the, um, here's the truth. We can cho- you can choose your words. We can choose our actions. But we can't choose the consequences of those things. Sometimes we have to bear them. Sometimes when we say something or do something, and we say, I'm really sorry, please forgive me. The forgiveness is there, but we have to bear the consequences of what we have said to someone while they process the hurt that we've inflicted or vice versa. We have to process the hurt that's been inflicted and the consequences are ours. We pay the price. Sometimes somebody else pays the price for what we've done, for what we've said. Consequences don't have feelings. They're either good or bad. You can speak words of life like my darling Gary did. The consequences to that was such a happy life, such a wonderful, wonderful life that we had together because of what he did, partly just such a precious gift that we have to give. King David is a good example of consequences. This is what he said in in Psalm 51. Well, first of all, he said this after he'd committed adultery with Bathsheba, the arranged murder of her husband Uriah, and the confronting finger of judgment from the prophet Nathan. And I always say I think his finger was bony. I don't know whether it was or not. It could be real chubby, but I've always seen a bony finger sticking right in in King David's face telling that story and then saying, you're the man, you're the one who's done this. And here's what David said after being confronted with a terrible sin. He said, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. That phrase blot out, it literally means in the Hebrew, unsin me. Because David wasn't just in, um, he wasn't just concerned about the guilt of his sin. He was concerned about the sin itself. And he was so desperate to have relationship again with his Savior, with his God that he served. He said, "He said, oh, he was desperate. God, can you just rip it out of me? Can you unsin that which I have done against you? Because that's what he said against you. I've sinned, God. And blot out my transgression. And that was, uh, or the second part is cleanse me. Is the, the Hebrew picture of that is on a washboard or a, a rock taking a piece of cloth that's soiled and rubbing it out on a rock to try to cleanse that stain. So this this shows genuine um, sorrow, godly sorrow for our sin, repentance for what he has done. However, the consequences came. The baby that was conceived with his sin with Bathsheba died. His kingdom was never the same after that, that it was before. 
And third, his family was fractured and remained fractured because those are the consequences. God forgave him and called him a man after my own heart. How exciting is that? But David never was able to escape the consequences of what he had done. And so that's just the way the law is. The law of doing good and the law of doing evil. The law of making bad choices and the law of making good choices. We get to reap that. That's, what the, that's a biblical principle too that you all know. And then the last picture of forgiveness is that beautiful picture of the prodigal. Um, Og Mandino wrote a beautiful book called The Prodigal God, which I uh, co-opted for me uh, because it just spoke to me so much because he said that the word prodigal so much more um, fits the father than the son because it means lavish, profuse, with, uh, without restraint extravagant. And he says, yes, the kid did a lot of stuff, but the father's love was so much more extravagant. And you know the story. I want my stuff. I'm going to go uh, onto my own. I'm taking the bus out. Give me my thing. Give me my inheritance. And they were his. So the father with prodigal love gave him what he asked for because that's love. Even though the, I think the father's heart was probably just broken because he, he thought, oh no, this is not a good sign. But his heart is already in the far country. You know, if you find yourself in a place that's not really good, your heart's already been there. It went there first. If your body's in a difficult place, a place you know you're not supposed to be, if you're not where you're supposed to be and you should be, your heart was there first because apostasy always begins in the heart and the body follows. So he had riotous living. If we put it in today's, he... he uh, uh, maxed out all his credit cards. He went to brothels and drinking and gambling and uh, gaming and all the things as of today. But back then he did the same thing. And uh, riotous living, the Bible says. Um, and then unexpected consequences came that he wasn't counting on. No, he didn't think about this. Famine. Ooh. His friends, whoosh, they were out of there. They were gone because the credit card was maxed out. Um, and then he began to be in want. And he became a slave. All was lost. Pain drove him to reality. And the Bible says he came to himself and he headed for home. But he didn't head for home arrogant. He didn't take a taxi. He didn't have a taxi. He didn't even have a donkey. He didn't have shoes. The Bible says he didn't even have shoes. He was filthy, dirty, smelly. He smelled like the pigsty where he had worked. But he was repenting. And he said, if I go back to my dad, I know I'm not a son. I'll just be a servant. And then the story changes. And the father, the prodigality, the positive prodigality of the father takes center stage. And the spotlight is on him. And he watched every day. I can just see him coming out to that big portico in the front of his beautiful home and looking and scanning his eyes against the sun to see and waiting there. And then at nighttime, right at dusk, to go to look, straining to see and waiting and waiting. Love gave him patience to wait. Then it says he saw him afar off. In those days, if you were a rich man, you don't, you don't run. That was considered uh, beneath you. But love put roller skates on that man's feet. And the Bible says he took off, saw him from afar off, and he was propelled to run because he, he recognized his, um, how he walked. That's him. I know. I can see him coming. Um, and then it says, the Bible says he embraced him. He embraced him over the filthy body, the rags, the stink, unwashed hair, unwashed body, unwashed clothes, the smell of the swine that he had worked with. And then the Bible says that he kissed him. And this came first. The kiss came first before the confession. It opened his mouth. The, the embrace and the kiss opened his mouth and the confession came first. Love opened his mouth and his heart and then forgiveness and restoration. The robe was put on him, his daddy's robe. The ring, he took it off of his finger and put it on that filthy, dirty finger right over it, the dirt and the mess. Put sandals. He looked down and realized oh, he's been in slavery and put sandals on those feet, 
No son of mine is going to be a slave. It's the picture of our father. He runs to us. He puts on us the robe of righteousness over our sin as we confess and say, Father, we have sinned against him. And here's the last question. What if, what if on his way back to the father, the elder son that had always been there had been down working in the lower 40 instead of the upper 40 and saw his brother coming? What if he had met the older son first? We know what kind of an attitude the older son had when he found out that his, his younger brother was home. He was furious. So you can just imagine what, what, what could have happened if they would have met prior to the father. What are you doing coming back here? Look at you. You stink. Oh, I can't believe it. We know. We've had, yeah, we know all about. We've had the reports about what you're doing and what you've dra dragged our name through and all the things that you've done. Don't even think about coming back here. You make me sit and on and on. You know what you've done to our father, blah, blah, blah. And I'm sure that had that scenario happened, that younger brother just would have turned around, kicked that can back down the dusty road. And my question, when I read this story, my question to my own self was, hmm, do you think that the younger brother would have made it to the father had he met the older brother first? I don't think so. And I asked myself, I wonder if people making their way back to the Father for forgiveness and restoration and a new start and a new life and they run into me, do they make it? Or are they so discouraged by my attitude or my condemnation or my judgment that they just turn around and they never keep going to the Father? Because the Father's love is unleashed immediately when a heart starts coming back and his love begins to constrain them to himself. So that's the question. Are we a bridge to forgiveness? I want to be. I want to be able to lay down and have people walk right over me to get to the Father. Because as the Father has forgiven me, we can forgive others. And we can be a bridge to forgiveness for others that are coming back to their Father. To be restored just like we were. Just like you and I have been restored to relationship with God through the perfect sacrifice of his son. That's what it cost Jesus. It cost him his life to love us. The cost of forgiveness, yeah, the exact extent of his loss is what it cost him. And God says, because of that, because I live inside of you, you can forgive and you can receive forgiveness. We can and we can get out of the prison of bitterness. We can get out of the jail cell of resentment. And we can live free and clear and carry within us the beauty of the Savior. That's what we can carry. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done, Lord. We are, of all people, most pitiful, Father, without you. We could never attain to your righteousness and holiness, but you shed your blood to cover us, to put your robes of righteousness over our filthy rags. That's what our righteousness is. They're just filthy, disgusting, dirty, but you put righteous robes over us as we called out to you. And the, the ring of sonship, you did all that because of your love, Lord, and what it cost you is unspeakable. There's no way for us in our finite minds to even understand, but thank you that you did it. And thank you that we carry that ability to forgive and give someone back their life within us. Not because we're good. We're not. Gary was just a person, but he carried you in him and he was able to unleash that incredible gift of forgiveness to me, to give me something that changed me forever. Thank you for that, Lord. We want to do that. We want to do that, God, and be free. You want us to be free. And so we thank you that in this prayer, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. You have given us the key to ending bitterness and resentment in our life. For this, we are most grateful. And we thank you in Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a great week. And if you need to forgive somebody, start today. And if you need to receive forgiveness, 
Start today. God bless.